today we will discuss about a great poem by Anne Bradstreet. It's entitled Prologue. And you know what is the meaning of prologue? We will later discuss about the text, its theme, and also the textual analysis of this particular poem. Now, first, uh, let us know about something. Uh, this great American poet called Anne Bradstreet. Now, if we uh, look into or uh, have a brief introduction of a of her career of her life, we'll find that she was born uh, in England. Obviously, she was born in England in 1612. So she belonged to 17th century, the time when Shakespeare died, when Jacobean drama was its hell in England, in, Elizabeth, in Jacobean theatre. We have John Donne also in English uh, literature. But she was just born at the time, that is early 17th century. Later, she emigrated to Massachusetts, that is in America. And you know that America was discovered by Columbus and for the Europeans at the time, America was called or the whole continent of uh, North America was called the New World or New Universe because it was not known to the European culture, to the European uh, people uh, till uh, Columbus discovered it and made it possible to explore it uh, for the colonizers, for the especially for the Spanish and British colonizers. Now, what do you find that a lot of uh, English people and Europeans, Portuguese, Spanish, they went to America and settled there because of the new opportunity, because of the vast land, vast resources that uh, they found there. So they immigrated to Massachusetts like other many other Europeans. And she went with her father, Thomas Dudley, and her husband, Simon Bradstreet. But at the age of 16, I think uh, this is the age when she married. You know, it was quite a tradition, a tried custom in the society to, for the young girls to get married by 14, 15 or 16 uh, at the most. So this was a very unhealthy practice considering uh, uh, different factors, biological factors and social factors. But that was the custom at the time. Now, uh, after she emigrated to uh, United States and Massachusetts and settled there, and you can uh, find that she had almost eight children between 1633 to 1652. And she had to raise and look after these eight children. So this was a quite daunting task. So, and, uh, her family belonged to Puritan sect and even though Puritans were very uh, strict and disciplined people, they followed a very orthodox and ritualized and disciplined lifestyle. So for a girl of 16 to marry, to have family and raising and becoming the mother of eight children and then raising them and you know that uh, each of these occasions of motherhood was like a life and death situation, especially at the 17th century. Because the lack of medical facilities, back lack of medical technologies at the time, you'll find that a lot of uh, women died, a uh, lot of mothers died giving birth while giving birth. And these subjects has been explored by different novelists uh, including Emily Bronte, uh, you'll find different novelists explore this theme of uh, mothers dying while giving birth and how that even causes trauma, and psychological trauma to the characters, to the husband, to the ch uh, children, to the family members. But she overcame these 
hurdles and successfully managed to look after her family from the very young age and from a very young age she had the talent to write and for poetry and you will find that her poems were first poem where poems were first published in london and without her knowledge without her permission uh, it was done by her brother in law and it was published in six, in 1650 and it was entitled the tenth muse lately sprung up in america if you notice the title this title is very uh, symbolic the tenth muse you know that in greek and pagan culture and creed in classical roman creed in classical roman culture in ancient roman culture you will find there were nine muses and these nine muses were actually the source of inspiration for different uh, fine arts poetry music all sorts of fine things of human culture of human values of human civilization so this the title is very symbolic that and brass street is being referred as the 10th muse after the ninth muse nine muses in classical literature lately sprung up in america so suddenly her talent was discovered in america but it was published in london without the consent by her brother in law later of course this uh, 10th muse the 10th muse was later revised and expanded as several poems compiled with great variety of wit and learning and it was revised in 16 revised and published in 1678 you know that 1678 is a time in england in english literature uh, it is called restoration period it was a new classical age dominated by like john dryden and other great new classical writers of this era but at the time in america we find young woman called and brastreet is writing well is composing well and her talent being recognized also in england because there were not so much of society not so much of cultural tradition in america because america was at that time just beginning to flourish just beginning to be colonized just beginning to be explored the societies industries were beginning to be flourish there but her recognition came in spite of all these hurdles in spite of all these uh, difficulties in uh, america in united states later on and finally she died in the 1672 so she was born in 17th century she died in 17th century late 17th century uh, in north andover massachusetts at the age of 60 and she died of tuberculosis tuberculosis at the known at the time was very much like a cancer yeah, you cannot treat as today we can treat tuberculosis which you call tb that is uh, a kind of bacterial inf infection but lot of women lot of including john keats you will find that later on in lot of english literary figures also died of tuberculosis so this is the brief or uh, introduction to the life and career of and brad street but let's now move on to the text that is our uh, central focus and that should be our central focus because why should you read uh, and brad street an american 17th century american poet what is there inside the text what is the theme which which she used to deal with so in order to move uh, you into that topic that is into the textual analysis i have to show you uh, some pictures uh, so first of all look at these pictures and try to just uh, see the pictures and try to uh, guess what are there in these pictures i have actually collected these Uh, pictures from various sources uh, from various sources in internet of course these are license free uh, 
uh, picture so there is no issue of uh, called royalty or copyright violation so that's why i use this picture there were so many thoughtful pictures but i want to show you these pictures why first of all of course to look at these pictures and then try to find out what these pictures contain and suggest just think for few seconds few minutes and these are well-known paintings actually these are not pictures these are well-known paintings most of the paintings in oil canvas oil canvases and uh, you find this few pictures belong to myth belong to classical myth roman myth greek myth uh, dealing with gods and goddesses <laughs> and uh, one or two pictures contain uh, about description of society about social relationships in the first picture we'll find that a lady uh, this is the picture let me see this is the picture this is the first picture and you will find that uh, a beautiful uh, lady and there is hello actually a circle this is called hello this hello is being uh, painted over her head and this is a sign that she is not a normal human being this is a sign that she perhaps is a god or goddess now in fact this is the famous renaissance render renaissance painting renaissance portrait of the muse you know that uh, in classical greek culture and roman culture and roman myth you have nine muses and these nine muses are the daughters of zeus and nemosin nemosin was also a goddess she is called to be the goddess of memory goddess of memory so memory is essential for fine arts since this all these daughters nine daughters these nine daughters represent different cultures different arts fine arts including poetry music and what we have is the picture of Calliope. Calliope is one of the muses and she is not only one of the muses she is also the dominant and the most wise that is the wisest of the muses of epic poetry so she is connected uh, to epic poetry and uh, if you know uh, if you have certain idea about greek mythology you'll find that uh, uh, calliope has a son and that son is called orpheus why i'm telling this is that this muse is being referred her son is being referred in this text uh, called prologue by Anne Bradstreet. The second picture you find uh, again uh, a picture of Calliope, painting of Calliope, but in different version. And we have uh, another uh, great angel. She is actually she is actually his cupid. And so we have what we have here: the god of love and also the epic poetry, muse of epic poetry. So these are connected in this text and in this corner painting you'll find that a woman that actually I'm uh, speaking about this picture let me say this picture yes this picture you'll find that uh, one woman is arguing with two men in classical society and in classical society is very uh, 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 rare that you find women arguing with men because of the patriarchal custom, because of the patriarchal domination. But what you find here, that woman is strongly arguing with these two men. And this argument is the basis of prologue written by Anne Brasted. And this is the painting of uh, actually a 17th, 16th and 17th century painting, where you find women, a woman, an aristocratic woman is being surrounded by few women. But here we find that in a society of women, there is no man, there is no man in this society. So women are restricted within a society. So with these pictures, what I am trying to suggest to you is that uh, uh, that the women, the position of women in the classical society and in the 16th and 17th century society, and with this theme, actually let me show you the next slide, and you will find that these are the 
yes and uh, after analyzing these pictures and observing these pictures what do you find that these things comes to our mind uh, and if you can uh, read out these uh, actually words first what i've written muses muses then we have the theme of patriarchy then we have a question after is poetic art natural so should we consider the art of poetry as natural which comes to naturally which you don't need to learn this is the question that is being asked raised by and breastfeed in this text and then obviously the theme of art versus nature these are the themes that you should uh, be conscious of while reading this uh, text by and breastfeed so let's move on to the text itself and find out what is there inside the text so without uh, having a new critical approach that is an approach which analyzes the text which interprets the meaning of the words meaning of the interplay of the words the relationship of the words with the phrases with the stanzas without doing that it is meaningless to explain and to appreciate great poems great poetry poetry is not rhymes it is not meant to be just vaguely analyzed every words that you analyze must have a rational logical philosophical psychological base whatever base whatever analogy you have or we have as human beings in our expose in our disposal we should apply that knowledge so poetry is actually multidisciplinary nature multidisciplinary art because it explores all the aspects of human existence so let's uh, analyze the text it's entitled prologue prologue what is prologue you know poet prologue means a kind of introduction just prelude is a kind of introductory music introduction to a music to a song similarly prologue means a kind of introduction to literary work to plays to compositions so prologue introduces something so what is being introduced here let's see to sing of wars of captains and of kings of cities founded commonwealths begun for my main pain are two superior things this is the first sentence this first sentence contains three verses three lines three verse lines and if you see if you paraphrase this it will be like this that subjects like singing of wars singing of captains great captains of wars singing of great kings celebrating or singing of great cities which have been founded established singing about commonwealths how they began their journey i'll explain what is commonwealth i'm just paraphrasing organizing the sentence first for my main pain are two superior things these are the subjects too superior for my too superior for my pain and my pain is mean mean means low base so my pain is base means i am base i as a woman writer as a female writer is base who considers this who thinks this society thinks this the patriarchal society thinks that women are inferior women are inferior sex not superior and for them to deal with the subjects of war subjects of captains kings great cities great commonwealths they should not dare to do that because they are two big things they are two superior things so this is the humble tone with which and brastreet starts actually the poetic persona gives a voice represents here and brastreet or any female poet of the 17th century of the 16th century now when we speak of wars 
obviously the subjects of epic in Iliad, Odyssey. We, we find great captains, great warriors, we find great kings like King Agamemnon, Ulysses fighting in Iliad. We find great cities, how Troy was founded. So these how commonwealths, the commonwealths means Roman commonwealths where we find a lot of society states connected together for the common good of those states. This is a kind of alliance between different nations. Even commonwealths, the notion of commonwealths politically is prevalent today, is ex uh, exists today. So for commonwealths, the custom of commonwealths has a long tradition, especially if you go back to Roman history, we'll find the concept of commonwealths. So these are great subjects. We, as women, should not deal with these great subjects. This is the tone, this is the tone with which she starts this text. Or how they all, or each their dates have run. Let's poets and historians set this forth. My obscure light shall not so deem their worth. Notice how simply the poetic persona has convinced her, has expressed her humble tone, her humility. She says that these subjects, how they all and each their dates are run, how these great cities, great subjects have finished their course in history. Dates means a kind of chronological beginning and ending. Everything has a beginning, everything has ending. So they have run their dates means they have finished their course in history. So these are historical subjects, great subjects in history. Let poets and historians set this forth. Let them write about these things. We are women. We don't have the right to write about such things. My obscure lines. This poem is my obscure lines. Obscure means, obscurity means not known, not famous. So my lines are not famous. And my obscure verse shall not or should not. Notice the tone of assertion that these should not. This is the assertion of patriarchal society. As if someone tells that you should not deem their worth. Whose oath? That is the oath of these great poets and historians. Worth means importance. So you should not, as a woman writer, should not try or dare to obscure their writing or their composition. You are mean, you are base, you are woman. Why should you dare to do such thing? In the next lines, next stanza, if you move on to the next stanza, second stanza, what you find is much more humble tone. The tone of humility becomes much more greater at the second stanza. But what? But when my wandering eyes and envious heart, great Bartha's sugared lines do but read over full, I do grudge the muses did not part. Twixt him and me that overflowing store. This is the first line. Actually, this is the first sentence which constitutes four lines. And these four lines are connected with one argument. And what is that argument? But when my wandering eyes, when I read over, that is repeatedly read, the great Bartha sugared lines. Sugar means not sweet. Sugar means eloquent, melodious, and famous, obviously. So eloquent, beautiful lines, that is verses written by great poem, great poet, it's great French poet. His name is Galum da Bartas. He's a great French poet who used to write heroic poems, heroic poetry. <coughs> and uh, you know that in the first uh, section of, the, of this text, you have the allusion to heroic subjects, to epic subjects. 
as if epic subjects like Iliad. We have also a reference to the French heroic poem like Calium da Bartos. So when I read, when my wandering eyes read again and again, the sugared lines of great poet Bartos, great French poet Bartos, my heart becomes envious. My heart becomes envious. I envy over the art and ability of great French poet Bartos. Now, Anne Bradstreet has a great uh, phone for uh, great uh, admiration for this great French poet Bartos. Now, I just want to remind you of the fact that uh, when the Tenth Muse was published in uh, 1650, it also contained a great poem, lyrics uh, by Bhaktas and also as well as also a dedication, dedicatory elegy to the great English sonneteer and great English poet Sir Philip Sidney. So it was a kind of indication that she inspired, she admired and was inspired by these two great poets. One is Sir Philip Sidney and the other one is, of course, this French poet Bartas, Calion de Bartas. So she says, the poetic person says, when I read over and over these, the great poems of these poets, I feel that I'm a fool, I'm just a fool. And I'm not only envious, I also grudge, I do grudge. Grudge means a kind of complaint, a kind of complaint, a kind of grievance against the muses. Why? Because the muses did not part. Did not part means did not share betwixt him and me that overflowing store. Betwixt him means between the great French poet Bartas and myself, me, myself. And what didn't the muse didn't share? The muse didn't share that overflowing store. So sharing that store, first of all, uh, let us know what is this overflowing store. Overflowing store means the skill, the fluent skill or eloquent skill of writing and composing and expressing verse and composing great fluent eloquent poetry. So store means a kind of uh, collection of skills. So the poetic persona complains against the muses. And as I showed you in my uh, pictures in this earlier, uh, uh, let me just show you again. Uh, you can find this picture that we have the reference to muses. And uh, in, by referring to the muses again and again, what she wants to prove that all the muses are within themselves. But the patriarchal society doesn't consider that women are as good as female poets. And this will later become a controversial subject for the feminists, for the feminist writers, and for the thinkers and the philosophers who explored feminism and the history of female writers. I will deal with that later on, but let us first discuss about this text. So the poetic persona complains against the muses. The why didn't you share that art, that skill with uh, Bartas as well as with me? Why didn't you give me that skill, that overthrowing skill to me a bit? If you uh, did that, I could have written such sugared lines like what the steed. No, move on to the next line. As Barthas can do what a Barthas will. A Barthas use of article, a use of article actually, that any poet like Barthas can do what any poet like Barthas will do. So they had that ability to fulfill their wish because they had their skill given to them, gifted to them by the muses. But no, we are not such fortunate enough. But simple, I according to my skill. But I as woman had to follow my own skill because my school is limited by the muses. 
so I am unfortunate. So what we find uh, in these first two stages of this text called prologue, we find that the persona or the poetic voice is complaining against the patriarchal perception, the social patriarchal perception that women are not good enough or qualified enough to write poetry. And whom to accuse? Of course, to fate, to goddess, to gods, to divine power. And this is typically the tradition, had been the tradition to condemn fate for social injustice. What we find here is actually a feminist uh, point of view. Although feminists uh, started in 1960s as a movement, but its root and history are much longer. In fact, critics have differentiated and identified three stages of feminism. And these first stage that uh, is called actually feminine phase of feminist history. What is feminine phase? Feminine phase means the phase of the history when female writers tend to be inspired or tend to seek inspiration from masculine powers or male poets. Male poets at the time were seen as source of inspiration. In the second phase is called feminist phase. In the history, after especially during the first half of the 20th century, we find this feminist phase. When women, female writers tend to explore and appreciate female writings, female writers, as compared to male writers. And at the last stage, that is the second half of the 20th century, we find this feminist phase, where we find the writers tend to psychologically explore the female experience, the female psychology through language, through psychology. Of course, these three different phases also can be broadly categorized into two broader sections of feminist movement. The first section is called American or Anglo-American feminist movement. And the second is the French feminist movement. American or Anglo-American movement is actually dominated by historical explorations, historical explorations and research about women writings, about women writers, their subjects, their themes. Whereas the French feminists like Julia Kristeva, like Helen Sixes, you will find them to be much more preoccupied with psychology, with language. In fact, they conceived an idea of a creature feminine. A creature feminine means exclusive language which is oriented towards female experience. They feel, these French theorists, French feminists, and theorists feel that they felt that uh, female experience cannot be expressed through male language, through masculine language. That's why they try to uh, conceive, they try to find out a different language, which is be which will be as against and different from the masculine language. Now, coming back to this text by prologue, uh, called Prologue by Anne Bradstreet, what you find is obviously the first page 
the phase called feminine phase when women writers of the early of the late 19th century from 1850 to 1900 they tend to seek exploration they tend to uh, they tend to seek the male poets as the inspiration and what you find that a 17th century american poet called Anne bradstreet is doing the same thing but she is going through also the feminine phase she is seeking the inspiration from male writers like Barthas, but also is criticizing the patriarchal writers the patriarchal society for their lack of sensibility for the lack of appreciation of women writings and women writers move on to the next stage so when you have to deal with these themes obviously substantiate your answer your discussion with this portion of the text without substantiation from the text illustration from the text no critical discussion is i think valid and should not be valid because criticism especially literary criticism must be based on detailed textual analysis without detailed textual analysis and in evidence our discussion often proved to be very vague obscure let's move on to the next changes from schoolboys tongues no rhetoric we expect nor yet a sweet concert from broken strings no perfect beauty was a main defect this is actually a grudge this is a suppressed anger this is because this is the general perception of the society general perception of the patriarchal society that broken broken strings of a musical stream instrument cannot create a sweet melody a sweet concert or an immature schoolboy's voice schoolboy's tongues cannot compose a great rhetoric or a defective beauty cannot be a perfect beauty this is the perception about female that they are like immature schoolboys that they are like broken strings that they are like a defective beauty this is the general perception of the society and we know that this is a meaningless perception my foolish broken blemished muse so sings and this to me in the last no art is able cause nature made it so irreparable again the voice of suppressed anger suppressed complaints against the society that you as a society consider us to be broken to be foolish to be blemished so we have to accept this as a reality but this reality is not a reality this reality is created by you this is an illusion <laughs> you consider that our poetical ability our poetic inspiration or muse is blemished foolish you as males consider that we females are female writers are defective and we are naturally defective and we cannot be mended we cannot be improved by any art by any effort by any skill because we are naturally defective and this of course creates a conflict between nature versus art we know that in uh, later romantic uh, period in english romanticism and german romanticism you find that art human art is often contradictory to nature nature is considered to be against human art but 
Critics like and great poets like S.T. Coleridge consider that often we need to synthesize art with nature. And if we are able to synthesize art with nature, great creations happen. Great creations occur. But what is the prejudice of 18th century, 17th century society? Even American society, European society, that women are defective. They cannot mend themselves, improve themselves, or repair themselves by art or skill. How can we acquire art? Obviously, study. You must have read the great sonnet by Sir Philip Sidney, who says that art is natural. But this is a controversial subject. Later critics, they consider that art is not at all natural. Art depends on study. Art depends on skill. Why did I mention Sir Philip Sidney? Because uh, this poet and Bradstreet also admired Philip Sidney as her inspiration, as a poetic inspiration. So she is actually questioning and doubting the theory by Sir Philip Sidney also. Nor can I like that fluent, sweet tongue Greek who list at first in future times speak plain. It refers to the great Demosthenes. I spoke about him, the great 14th century Greek orator. He was a Greek orator, but who lives at first we know that at the initial boyhood, he actually suffered from speech disability. That is, he can't speak fluently. He actually stammered a lot. But he worked hard with pebbles in, a, in his mouth and tried to speak by confining himself in a room and practice a lot. So with skills in future times, he could speak plain, fluently, and he became one of the greatest orators in history, eloquent orators. If you go back to the earlier uh, lines, you'll find that the historians, reference to historians and poets who were great. So we can put Demosthenes in that category of partners, of male poets, all the male poets and historians who dominated the history and the course of the history. She admires him. It's not that she denigrates him. She admires him. She looks for inspiration. As I say, this is the first phase of uh, feminist movement. That is feminine phase. By art, he gladly found what he did see. He what he sought, he sought fluent speech and by art, by effort, he gladly achieved that. A full requital of his striving plane. A full reward, a complete reward of his struggling effort, of his struggling art. So with hard work, with hard study and skill, he achieved what he did and he achieved reward, great fame. Great speech, eloquence in his speech, great oratorical skill he acquired. So, what does he, what does she want to prove? She wants to prove that art can do much, but this maxim is most sure. So, art can do much. This has been proven by these lines, by the instance of great orator Demosthenes. That he overcame his difficulty of tongue, his physical disability by working hard. So art can do much. So these actually proves these two lines, that is the last two lines of the last stanza, previous stanza, that <coughs> art cannot mend something which is natural, something which is natural. But she proves that no, art can repair something which is natural. What was natural? He had a natural, Demosthenes had a natural inability to speak fluently. 
but here we find that <laughs> and <clears throat> moving on to the next section that is our uh, next stanza what you will find that uh, again she is accusing the social patriarchal perception what is that perception that art can do much but this maxim is most sure what maxim is most sure maxim is a proverb the next sentence is a maxim a weak or wounded brain admits no cure that we are women as considered to be weak or wounded or defective our brain is defective wounded and it admits no cure it cannot be cured it cannot be repaired again the same argument but is this true what do you think this is true of course not everything can be improved if not fully cured but improve at least by hard work by study by efforts and by skill move on to the next time job i am obnoxious to each carping tongue who says my hand a li little better fits of course when i again and again prove the male maxims or the prejudice maxims of the male that they are wrong what they will think they will consider to be very annoying they will take me to be annoying or boxious to each carping tongue to each annoying voices and i will be of course very much vulnerable to them vulnerable to those annoying voices who says my hand fits better a needle so i should not write with pain i should actually work with needles this is the tradition male patriarchal tradition of perception that women are fit for domestic works not for writing or composition or intellectual activity a poet spain all scorn i should that's wrong and all scorn all scorn to me all rebuke to me that i should that's wrong a poet spain if i take up a poet spain if i want to be a poet i would do injustice to the poetic tradition to the male tradition so women should not write this is the maxim this is the actually uh demand this is the order of the male centric society for such despite they cast on female weeds such disdain such despite such disdain they cast on female weeds who are they of course the males of course the carping tongue who criticize me the annoying voice they criticize me that i should not do this and as a general not only me they are against all the female weeds all the weedy females all the female who wants to be witty who wants to prove their wit and intelligence creativity but no actually the word wit uh, in 17th century has multiple connotations uh, as different from um, 20th century meaning of the word wit in 17th century 18th century and also 19th century you find the word wit has different connotations at different times but in 17th century it means it meant imagination intellectual capability sense of humor everything if what i do prove well it didn't advance even if i prove myself well even if my writing proves well it didn't advance anything it didn't progress anything or it didn't change the status of women the perception of women by the male society that will not be changed what they will say they will say it's stolen or else it was by chance this is the harsh reality even if some women are successful in writing great works in publishing great works 
great poetry or literature but they will say that they are stolen from other great poets or else this poem or their poems are actually accidental that is they are not the fruits of their heart study or the fruits of their wit but by mere chance they have composed such great works and this is the harshest insult that one can bear after a lot of hard work after a lot of struggle you are able to do something but people accuse that this is mere chance this is mere luck now again as i said that it refers to the first phase of feminine or movement feminine phase of feminist movement feminine phase as that phase as i said refers to a phase of history when women writers came to be inspired or sought inspiration from male poets so of course and brastri used to seek inspiration from sir philip sidney from uh bartas french poet galam de bartas but you can't call them you can't call her poetry to be stolen that will be insult okay? all the male writers also often found to be inspired or sought inspiration from other male writers so that then that doesn't mean that they are stealing something move on to the next section but sure the anti greeks were far more mild else of our sex why fain they those nine and poesy met calliope's own child now the poetic voice for the first time is not questioning the present society but questioning the past society the past greek society and she calls them to be foolish to be stu stupid ancient greeks anti greeks they were far more mild that is they were far more gentle or the word mild could mean also feminine why because she thinks they feigned they pretended these nine muses as their muses as their goddess of poetry and fine arts because they those nine muses in the initial part of my lecture i said that those muses are also female so why should we condemn female writers why should we discourage female writers because in ancient european culture is based on pagan culture in ancient european society so why should we condemn female writers because all the poetic inspiration comes from god goddess not gods so obviously according to the present interpretation present society the greeks were foolish to do, do so and they made calliope's own child poesy calliope's own child who was calliope's own child orpheus you must have heard the name of orpheus orpheus is called the greek father of poetry or greek father of song or music he was a legendary mythical character who was the son of calliope and we know of course the history of the story of orpheus and his wife eurydice that he wanted to rescue eurydice but he couldn't and after that he was killed by the bacchants that's a different story i would have different occasion for that so what is more that calliope is considered to be the greatest muse or the wisest muse of epic poetry and he she is a female so why should greeks do that greeks make why should greeks make a female goddess to be the muse of epic poetry that was wrong that was stupid to do who says this of course the present society the present is accusing the past is it that is it so so amongst the rest they place the arts divine among the rest of the nine muses that is the other eight muses they are also attributed with divine arts they are also worshiped 
as the muses of divine arts. But this weak nod they will full soon untie. But this is weak nod, this is a weak point, a weak mistake. Nod is a symbol of complex mistake. And who has this done this mistake, committed this mistake? Of course, the Greeks. And the present Greek society will untie, that is, will change this historical complexity or <coughs> historical perception about their gods and goddess. Can you change history? This is my question. No, you can't change. But when you try to change meaninglessly something, meaninglessly the history, it proves that you are wrong. It proves that you were foolish, not the Greeks. The Greeks did not but play the fools and lie. And this is the accusation of the present society. They, the present male-centric society of Europe and America, condemn the Greeks that they are foolish, that they are liars. They should not have worshipped this goddess as muses of poetry and arts. They are stupid to do so. Who is accusing this? Of course, the present society. Don't think that the poetic voice is accusing. The poetic voice is just representing the patriarchal, foolish patriarchal voice of the time. Foolish patriarchal perception of the time. Now move on to the next section. Before moving on to the section, I want to show you a slide and uh, look at the slide. You will find that uh, this is actually the whole structure of this text, of this poem. You will find that uh, we have the image of the muse, the image of Calliope, who is considered to be the greatest muse, wisest muse of epic poetry. And what we have in this text, that through his image, Anne Brastreet wants to critique, wants to criticize myth, wants to criticize history, wants to criticize the myth and history created by male society. Our most of the history books, most of the myths are written by male authors. And that's why there should be a certain male bias. So what Anne Brastit has done, she has assumed the person of a male stance. That all oh, females are not good enough. This is a male stance. That females cannot be improved, female minds cannot be improved. But by assuming this male stance, he has proved that this male stance is foolish. So, directly or indirectly, she wants to prove the meaninglessness and the bias of the male stance, of the male perception. Now, coming back to the text, uh, moving on to the text in the next section. Let Greeks be Greeks and women what they are. Men have presidency and still excel. This is a very arrogant voice. That okay, we can't change the Greeks. We can change the past. We can change the women. Let them be so. But still, whatever they say, we men have presidency, that is supremacy, sovereignty, and we'll excel still. Whatever you say, whatever you argue. What do you find? That in this argument, male stance is defeated. As I said, that this text is like uh, a debate text, a debate poem. And in this debate poem, who is lost? Of course, the male stance is lost. It's a debate between male stance and female stance. And when you are defeated by logic, by argument, you tend to be arrogant. And what do you say? Okay, I don't uh, follow these things and let them be so. This is the arrogant, foolish voice. It is but vain, unjustly to wage war. It is meaningless to wage unjustly a war. Of course, unjust war should not be waged. Men can do best and women know it well. Men can do best and women know it all. Women should recognize that men are supreme. Men are best. Preeminence in all and each is yours. And you should consider, you should concede that 
This is the voice of the female stance. You should detect who is speaking. You will find. So, what you find is uh, that uh, she acknowledges the defeat of the male centric. But what you find here that due to the arrogance, due to the aggressive nature of the male voice, notice the aggressive nature of the male voice. Let Greeks be Greeks and women that what they are, what they are, let them be so. It is but vain unjustly to wage war, to wage war against the male centric voice, the male presidency is meaningless. Of course, what is unjust to wage war against them or their argument is unjust. So each word is ironic. Waging war against male voice is not unjust at all. The arrogance of the male voice is unjust. But women are physically weak. What they can do? They can accept that arrogance. They can't do but accept that male arrogance. And that's why she says, the poetic voice says, preeminence in all and each is yours. She considers, she concedes that, okay, preeminence or supremacy in all the fields is, of course, yours. We agree that you are supreme. You are dominant. Yet, grant some small acknowledgement of ours. At least you should grant some little acknowledgement. This word is very important, acknowledgement. You should recognize, you should accept and recognize our contribution. That is the contribution of women, contribution of women towards human history, towards human civilization, human culture. Our contribution may be smaller, but that small contribution should be acknowledged by you. So we are not demanding supremacy. We are just demanding or claiming some acknowledgement. This is what the early feminists did. This is what the feminine phase is. As I again and again say that the history of feminism can be classified into three phases. Feminine phase, feminist phase and female phase. We are going through now female phase, but early, that is early part of the 18th century and 17th century, these were considered to be feminine phase. And that voice is much weaker, but in a subtle way, they criticized male perception of history, male perception of myth. And oh, you high flung quills that soared the sky, and ever with your fray, still catch your praise. If ever you deign these lowly lines, your eyes give time more personally rape. I ask no peace. These four lines are actually the final assertion and final demand and final conclusion of this debate. That yet, although in logical argument, we have defeated it. But due to your aggressive nature, due to your supreme supremacy in different fields, we have to accept that your quills, quills are actually uh, pains at the time, feathers which are used for pains. But quills also may refer to or symbolize the bards, the hunting bards of prey. That's why, oh, you high flown quills. So high flown quills refer to the noble, great, male writers that sowed the skies. So symbolically like bard, like eagle, they sowed the skies. And ever with your, ever with your prey, still catch your praise. And ever you will catch your praise. You still catch your praise. Because you are the great bard. So like catching victims, you will catch your praise. You will always have praise from different sections of society. Even we acknowledge, we praise you. We will praise you. But you should give some acknowledgement to us. Give some 
consideration to us. If ever you deign these lowly lines, your eyes, if ever your eyes deign, they means consider these lowly lines. These lowly lines refer to this text, whole text, the whole text, this whole text of this uh, poem called Prologue. These are called, as he said, the mean. No, go back to the first uh, stanza, you will find that my mean pen, you can see this, the mean pen. So similarly, my mean pen has written this lowly these lowly lines, these mean lines, these lines may not be good enough for you. But if you, if ever once you have read these, gone through this text, at least give time or personally it. We don't want no base. Base refers to the reed of laurel trees, laurel branches. And that laurel branches were symbolic of great honor from ancient time, from ancient Greek history. We don't demand any laurel branches. I just, we just demand or I just demand time or personal it. Don't, you don't have to give me great honor, but little honor, you can give me little honor. Now, personally or time, you know, this is ridiculous because these are used for spices, for spices in cooking. But since we are good enough in cooking, you consider that we are good enough in needling war in cooking so at least give that consideration at least give that rate to us as an honor to us as little honor to us we don't demand laurel as you demand as you are worthy we are not worthy so please at least give some kind of respect or acknowledgement to the symbol of time read or personally this mean and unrefined ore of mine Symbolically, ore refers to, you know, in mining metaphor, it refers to unrefined metals. So similarly, this text is unrefined, not polished, not good enough. So again and again, she considers that this text is mean, this text is unrefined, and her pain is mean, but at least you should consider that. At least you should read that. And this text will make your glistening gold but more to shine. And you have gold. You have bright gold. You have bright gold and the ornaments. And our ore will contribute towards your ornaments and will help you to shine more. This is very meaningful statement by female poets that okay, we don't demand any great honor, but you should recognize that we have held the male poets also, in different ways, from personal efforts, from individual efforts, from domestic life, we have inspired and helped male poets also to shine as ore helps golden ornaments to shine, gold ornaments to shine more. Similarly, we have helped. So please recognize our contribution to literature, to culture, to history and to civilization, even to you, to your life. This is what the female stance can demand. A 17th century female poet, American poet demands from the society, not much, but just mere recognition. So after reading this text, as I, I will uh, show you again, this uh, uh, theme that this text is a critic, a complete critic, complete critic of the myth, complete critic of the history, complete critic of the history and myth created by the male. Because myth, when you read myth and history, it appears to be male centric. It appears to be male, masculine. But you know that history, myth constitutes also females. We cannot obliterate them. We cannot suppress them, suppress their voice, suppress their existence. And that's what a female poet of the 17th century American history demands. She demands mere recognition, not supremacy. Of course, this text proves to be a supreme example of the feminine phase of feminist movement when female writers 
tend to be inspired, sought inspiration from male poets, male intellectuals. But at least we should have, history should have given them certain kind of respect, recognition and acknowledgement. That's what she demands. We don't, she doesn't need laurel branches. She just needs little recognition like the first lift rib or time rib. It seems, it sounds very ridiculous, a reed made of thymes, but history is ridiculous, meat is ridiculous. Why? Because it has ignored, it has ignored to recognize the contribution made by the female writers, by the female poets, by the female intellects. Uh, let's end our discussion, uh, but uh, before I sign off, uh, I should also uh, give you some references and useful links. You can go through these links uh, and uh, find out more about Anne Bradstreet, more about her poetry and also about her uh, texts, also about critical uh, interpretation of her texts. So you should uh, explore these links for further resource, for further uh, research, for further study. And what I also want to also um, assign to you certain questions to think about and to write your answer. If you can answer or discuss on these topics, the first topic is what do you think about patriarchal society, society, appreciation of women in 21st century. Actually, it should be patriarchal society's appreciation. So you should write down an answer and try to send it to my uh, email links. This is my email links. You can send your answer to me and I will try to appreciate that. The second question is that I suggested for you as an assignment is the persona just demanding appreciation and recognition from the patriarchal society. So what do you think? You have to justify your answer. Yes or no. Which line seems to be strongest critic of the male prejudice in this text? You have to go through the text again and try to find out which line, which phrase or which uh, two or three lines seem to be the strongest critic of the male prejudice of the text. There are lots of lines you will find similar lines, but you have to uh, choose one of them and justify why do you think that this is a critique, a strong critic against male prejudice of the uh, male prejudice of the society at the time. So I uh, hope you are uh, well and you appreciate these uh, all these slides of these discussions and try to uh, answer these assignments into my uh, into my emails to, uh, so I will appreciate that so thanks for watching my video watching my lecture and listening to it attentively thanks